So before we start, first of all, welcome everybody and thank you for being here. We're really happy that you could make it tonight. Um, so before we start, I just want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that this um, that is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Um, so, um, Tamara here is our speaker tonight, um, and Tamara works in Prince Edward County as a herbalist, and so she knows a lot of really neat and um, amazing things about plants, some of which she will share with you. Um, so first of all, Tamara, thank you so much for being here. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is, first of all, I think everyone's microphones are muted, but if you could just keep them muted during the talk, that would be great. Um, and I think what we're going to do is if you have questions as we're going along, you can type them in the chat and then tomorrow we'll um, get to them as they sort of um, fit into her talk. So um, yeah, I think I'll let her introduce what she's talking about and yeah, take it away. All right. Thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, happy to be here. And um, yeah, so I am here at the um, farm where I live in Prince Edward County, Ontario, which is um, on also Haudenosaunee and Wendat and also Mohawk territory. We have a Mohawk reserve right close by in Tyndamega territory. And um, so uh, it is beautiful country here. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. Um, it is uh, also on Lake Ontario, but much further east, and we're on an island in Lake Ontario. Um, so we get a bit of the lake effect weather. We get much more snow in the winter, and, uh, and then it kind of warms up a little bit sometimes sooner in the spring. And um, it gets really dry and we're in this incredible drought right now. So um, I have a dry well at the farm. So I am very, very much appreciating um, the water that is present on the land here, the rainwater that we've saved that I can use and, um, and the lake water that's nearby. Um, and, um, and then also, uh, yeah, I'm an herbalist and I work with plants all the time, pretty much. So um, in acknowledging the land, um, I, I, I want to also acknowledge the plants and I feel like, like the land really belongs to the plants. And, um, and so there are, there are so many different plants around here that are, that are really helpful and supportive for us in so many different ways as, um, as food and as medicine. And um, they've been here for so long. They are really our elders. So um, just wanted to acknowledge that. So uh, what I wanted to speak about was um, just about some of the plants that are really, really common that grow not only around here, but they grow like all over pretty much southern Ontario and many other parts of Canada and North America that, um, that I work with as, um, as an herbalist in my practice. I use them for healing, but also I'm a big wild foods enthusiast, so a lot of them are um, really good sources of food um, that are easy to find and easy to identify and such. So that's what I thought I'd talk about. I would share some um, photos with you, talk a little bit about how to identify some of these plants. And um, if you have questions, yeah, just throw them in the chat at any time and I'll get to them, as Gabrielle said. So uh, um, I think, um, where I want to start is, um, well, you know, I think right now we're in the season of um, the grapes, like in our region and maybe in your region too, we've got um, the wild grapes are, are, are flourishing. So I'm just going to try to find, here we go. Uh, Am I sharing? There we go. So I wanted to show you a photo of a grape leaf. Um, and uh, the grapes themselves, the blue grapes, 
you're going to recognize more easily because um, they're a cluster of grapes, except they look smaller than the ones that you find in the grocery store, and they are always blue. And the grapes, of course, are a vine. This uh, particular vine, this is uh, the more common wild grape that we find around here. It is Vitus riparia. It is the um, called river grapes. And um, we have another Vitus species that also is edible and we'll find it around here and it has a bit of a different shape leaf. But by recognizing the shape of the leaf, you can recognize the grapes in the different seasons, and then you have an opportunity to, um, first of all, know where to look when the grapes themselves are ready, because, um, uh, you know, they're wonderful to eat this time of year, but also you can recognize them before they're ready when the leaves are in good healthy shape and the leaves of the grapes are also edible. So, um, so looking at the leaf, you can see that it's, it's very broad and it's got all these points on it. It's, it's serrated all along the edges. It's not that um, dissimilar from a maple leaf, really, you know, it's got like a few major points and then it's got all these serrated edges. Um, you can see that it's coming out from a vine and it's got these little tendrils. If you look at the stem of the leaf, you see these, these sort of reddish pinkish tendrils that are like winding around. It looks like a little screw or like it's, it's like corking around. Um, so they, they send out those tendrils and they're often going to be sort of pinkish purplish color and they wind around tree branches or fences or anything they can climb. They're a vine and they like to climb. And um, the, these leaves, if they look healthy, if they don't have little, you know, fungal growths on them, which they tend to get, or they don't look dried or, you know, brown or whatever, but they look good and healthy like this, um, they can be eaten as a green. Usually uh, it's like around June, and if it's a really dry year, like we've had this year, the grapes love the drought and they really thrive. And so then these grape, these uh, leaves will continue to, to look very healthy um, when a lot of other plants are shriveling up and not doing very well. And so that's what happened this year. By this time of year, by the fall, the leaves are not looking as at their peak anymore, but, but all the way through the summer until um, into August, we had really nice looking grape leaves. And so we were eating them. I would, um, pick a few and chop them up and add them into my smoothies to make green smoothies. I like to add like wild greens into my, um, you know, I'll put like a banana and, you know, some kind of milk and like whatever kind of sweet stuff, maple syrup or something if I want to sweeten it more than just a banana. And, um, and I'll add um, whatever else I want to put in the smoothie and lots of greens. And I loved to um, add wild greens to my smoothie this summer, uh, wild grapes to my smoothies, because um, uh, some of the other uh, wild edible greens just weren't as abundant in, in the drought that we had, uh, but the grapes were thriving. So um, you can do that. You can use them as a cooked green. You can, um, you can add them to, uh, to like, uh, just chop them up and add them to your dishes and uh, your stir fries or your uh, pasta or whatever. Um, and of course, you can cook them, um, you can stuff them like, uh, like, and roll them up, like stuff them with like rice or lentils, maybe meat, um, and roll them up and cook them like the, the Middle Eastern dolmas, right? So um, that's the classic way of eating vine leaves. And it's a great way to eat them. And they're really nutritious. They're very, very high in vitamin C and many trace minerals. The, the um, grapes, the vines, the roots grow really, really deep. And so, um, they uh, they take up a lot of minerals from the soil and because they're perennial they'll keep growing every year their roots are always in the soil always taking up so many minerals uh they end up gathering um much many more nutrients than a lot of our annual vegetables that we grow in our gardens can where they only have one season of growth the grapes are like for years and years they're just drawing minerals up um and, um, and they are also really beneficial uh, to support the health of our, um, our blood vessels. They're really high in um, resveratrol, which is really important to support blood vessel health and to help clear the blood vessels. And it's anti-inflammatory and it's a really good antioxidant and all those um, 
beneficial nutritional aspects. So, um, so the leaves are really worthwhile eating. And I see that um, Jesse's asking, um, it might be a weird question, but what do the vines taste like? Would they not be really bitter? And um, I don't think that's a weird question at all. I mean, is it a good, you know, people wonder about wild foods. <laughs> um, are they tasty? Are they worth eating? Um, and uh, no, I don't think that the grapes are bitter at all. One aspect of their flavor, not the grapes, the grape leaves, I don't think that they're bitter. One aspect of their flavor is that they, um, they're they a bit astringent. They kind of, um, they're, ki uh, they're a bit like a, uh, drying on your tongue like like a uh, astringent flavor it's not really a flavor but the texture um it's like if you uh you bite into an unripe fruit like an unripe pear you know and you kind of pucker like it tightens up all those tissues the grape leaves are a little bit like that not like eating a right unripe pear that's less fun the grape leaves aren't quite that to that extent but they do have a lot of tannins they're pretty astringent um so they uh there, so that's one aspect where it makes it so that you don't really want to eat them raw because they they'll um, you'll experience that a little bit more unless they're really really young like very fresh tender leaves otherwise you want to cook them probably and then they become less astringent um, and then they just kind of taste like a green like they they just taste like a, a leafy green you know like maybe kind of a bit like spinach um, and another neat thing about them is that those little purple tendrils that come up um, I'll just show it one more time. Those um, those little guys, uh, these guys, they uh, if they are young and not tough, but they feel kind of like still pliable, like they're still winding, like like this one here. This is coming up from a <laughs> from another uh, a vine nearby, and it's just reaching over this leaf, and it looks more pinkish greenish, like it's 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 younger and it's not as tough. You can break those little pieces off and you can eat them and they have a really lovely lemony flavor which is pretty cool and i find that um uh children often really like that lemony flavor that kind of sour flavor and so they often really enjoy eating them and they're just they're kind of this neat shape and it's kind of a fun thing to do so uh, so those parts of the grapes you can eat and then um this time of year we can eat the le the the grapes themselves and they are a little bit sour but they also are sweet especially after we've had a frost they get a little sweeter um, we've been making grape syrups and grape jelly with them they also are really high in vitamin c they're um, really good immune boost and um, such a delicious source of um, like uh, good fruit uh, and and really resilient. And so this year they're they're just so abundant and we've been enjoying them so much. I always make sure that I don't harvest all of them though. I like to leave lots of them for the birds because of course uh, we need to support our bird population and other creatures will eat the grapes too. So that's my policy with harvesting any wild food, but especially fruits. I know that, you know, lots of the wild creatures need them too. So um, I don't overdo it and I always respect them. Um, no, under, knowing that you've got grapes, um, like in order to know that, that you have grapes and not something else, you, you want to, um, okay, one more time, I'm going to share the screen, um, this photo. Uh, so if you see this type of leaf and you see these serrated edges, you know that it's a grape leaf. If you see something like this, that's, that's broad, a broad leaf like this, and it has a few points, but all along the edges, it's smooth instead of serrated. That is going to be a different vine that 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 produces fruit that might look like grapes, but the grapes won't be in the same kind of clusters as the um, as the wild grapes that really look like like clusters of grapes you buy in the grocery store, only smaller. They'd be growing off of individual stems. Um, and yeah, notice the edges of these leaves. They should be quite serrated. If they're smooth, it might be a vine called the Canada Moonseed. And, um, and that one, the, the berries that they make that look like grapes are not edible. And they won't be in the same kind of grape-like clusters, but they will look kind of similar and they can be growing intertwined with the grapes. So you wanna be sure that you're getting something that's coming off the, the, the proper um, 
vine. Um, if the grapes are really, uh, if berries that you're looking at and they're not grapes, they have a very um, reddish colored um, stalk that they're growing or stems that they're growing off of, a bright red stems, they're not grapes also. They're another vine called the Virginia creeper that grows around here. And the Virginia creeper has a five um, leaflet uh, leaf. It's got like five separate kind of lobes going all the way around in a circle and this time of year they're starting to turn red a really beautiful shade of red those leaves um, but if they're not turning red they'll look like the, they'll grow right in with the grapes so you want to differentiate and make sure you're actually getting grapes if you eat the other ones by accident they won't taste good and that's okay then you spit them out and they they won't be toxic but if you ate kept eating them they could be so <laughs> so just to differentiate um, so uh, then I want to get to maybe a different wild edible green that also has a lemony flavor. So that is um, this one here, which is the, um, okay, so look at these leaves. This is called wood spell wood sorrel. Look at these leaves, they have like clover, right? These leaves have um, three leaflets, but look closer at them and you'll see that each leaflet, some of these are a little yellow, they should be green, but there's a good, good image of them. Each leaflet is in a, the shape of a perfect heart and that, that's the case on all of them perfect heart-shaped leaf. This is a plant that will you'll find growing often in sort of shady areas, sometimes on lawns or like in the edges of forests, and it's pretty common. So wood sorrel is, um, is an edible green. These leaves, if you eat them, will taste like lemon. Uh, they're sour and delicious, and you can just add them to salads. They make flowers that are yellow and they have five petals and they're really little and the plant just grows like up to your ankles or your shins. It's not very high. Uh, sometimes it'll show up as a garden weed. Um, and wood sorrel is also a good source of vitamin C and um, it's just got really shallow roots so if it comes up as a weed you can in your garden you can pull it out really easily but often you'll just find it growing wild like I was saying trail sides on lawns. Um, and uh, if you just pick the tops, more of them will grow. And again, you know, this sour flavor, I find kids really love, and they also remember this plant really easily because the leaves are all heart-shaped. So it's really sweet, and it's easy to recognize and easy to remember. Um, so this is Oxalis uh, stricta, it's called Oxalis stricta. It's in the the genus oxalis, which is indicating there are some oxalic acids in it, which makes it a bit sour. Um, and for people who tend to form um, stones, that they get like kidney stones and such, um, you don't want to have too much oxalic acid. Those people have to be careful how, my, how many greens they consume, how much spinach and such. They have to cook it well before they consume it um, because it can help them, it can contribute to building stones. So it would be the same with this plant. But if you just wanted to pick a little bit and add it to your salads, it would be good. And if you're not somebody who tends to form kidney stones, you can eat lots of it very safely and it's really nutritious and it's very delicious. Um, so, you know, I really recommend it. Wood sorrel is um, widely, widely available. And there is clover that looks really similar um, with the three leaflets that you'll find a, a kind of clover. We have a yellow clover that makes yellow flowers like that. But the, the leaves are never in that perfect heart shape. If you see three leaflets, perfect heart shape, that's wood sorrel. Taste a leaf and it's delightful. You'll love it. And that keeps going into until we get a hard frost. So those are still available to harvest. Um, you know, the nice thing about um, bringing wild foods into your diet is that uh, one of the nice things is that um, even if you just bring a little bit in, um, you're, you're generally getting a pretty big nutritional boost, you know, because um, 
the plants are really resilient. They're thriving on their own without anybody looking after them. Sometimes they're, you know, they're not getting watered, even in a drought. Uh, they're not getting fed. Um, you know, there, there aren't, you don't have other weeds that are getting pulled out around them. They have to thrive amongst all the other plants and work it out for themselves. So they've got this amazing resilience that, um, that comes through to you and you get some of that resilience when you eat them. And in order for them to survive and thrive, they have to be really healthy and take up as many nutrients as they can and hold on to them and make good use of them. And so they're really good at doing that. They have to fight off pests. So they're really good at doing that. So they often are gonna help you to do the same thing, boosting your immune system and giving you more resilience against um, you know, any bugs that might try to, to get into your system um, and um, and so you don't have to you know get a whole bunch of it even if it just seems like oh I just have this little handful of greens that I picked add that into your salads and you're just giving yourself this extra boost of wild vitality which is a really great idea and then with a lot of them they're perennial plants and whenever you're dealing with perennial plants those roots are growing deep in the soil and they're taking up minerals and so they become a really good source of trace minerals. Um, so then next what else do I want to share with you? Um, okay so because we've been having this really droughty season um, another plant that has thrived this is more of a medicinal plant uh, is the mullen. So um, a lot of you probably recognize this one. This is, um, you know, these furry leaves uh, that love to grow in this kind of ground. You can see that there's there's gravel and it's really dry underneath it. Um, and it's just growing just fine right here. And um, the mullen in its it's a it's a two year cycle of growth. It's a it's a biennial plant. So in its second year, it will send up a flowering stalk with yellow flowers um, at the top of it in a in a spike, um, and uh, and then it'll seed and it'll die back. And this plant is in its first year, so it's got just this basal rosette of leaves. The leaves are just right on the ground, no flowering stalk coming up. So these leaves, the mullen leaves, um, we work with in herbal medicine, and they are so, so useful. It's really great to know about. Um, you can use mullen leaves, uh, you can dry them and make tea with them for all sorts of coughs. They're a really wonderful cough medicine. Um, and they help to relax a cough that's really overactive. But if you have the kind of cough where it's really stuck and you keep trying to cough, but you can't quite, it's not quite clearing stuff out, then they'll be more stimulating and they'll help to, um, to stimulate a healthy cough. And meanwhile, um, they're very anti-inflammatory in the lungs and, the, and they're a good lymphatic herb. So if you're sick, they're really going to help you to move through it faster and to heal faster. Sometimes people with asthma do well with um, mullen tea because it's anti-inflammatory in the lungs and so it helps you to breathe better um, and in the same way that it helps to clear out stuff you don't want and support the healthy tissues that you do want um, in the lungs it actually does that throughout the body um, both inside and outside so the leaves of of mullen can be harvested and chopped up and um, Put in a jar and then you pour some oil, any kind of oil, olive oil or sunflower oil or maybe grapeseed oil. Um, pour it over them, have them chopped up so it's full, uh, the jar is filled with them and then um, pour the oil over them and then let that jar sit in the sun for about a month and you make an infused oil which um, after the month you can strain that out and that oil can be used um, on all kinds of uh, cuts and scrapes and inflammation on the skin, infections, um, and also even on broken bones. If you have a broken bone and you have access to it, like it's not under a cast, you can rub that oil on it. Um, and if you have access to the fresh leaves or dried leaves uh, on their own, you can just um, put them, put, put some warm water over them to soften them and then just lay them over the broken bone and let them, let that, you know, sit there like that for about 20 minutes or something every day. Um, 
or just use that infused oil and rub it in every day. And it will help your bones to heal properly. It will help them to set properly. It will speed up the healing. It's really amazing. You can also use that infused oil as a massage oil um, to help soften tissues and allow them to move into the alignment that they need to be and allow more nourishment to get into them if they're all kind of dried up and, and um, tense. And um, so I know some massage therapists that work with the, the infused oil of mullein and they really, really like it for certain people. Um, so um, that's a, a herb that is, you can't go wrong if you, you know, you can't really mistake this one for anything else. It's, um, this is, you know, the only herb that people sometimes call it lamb's ear. Um, they compare it to, or they think it's the same as um, a garden herb called lamb's ear that, that, that uh, has that those furry leaves and they'll make a different kind of flower. Um, but the lamb's ears only grow in gardens. This one mullen grows in the wild and sometimes it'll show up as a garden weed. When it shows up in my garden, I let it stay because I like to use it as medicine. Um, but often you'll find it in the wild. And um, in these places where there's dry soil, where it's rocky and particularly where it's been disturbed. Um, so where the soil has been disturbed like in a garden bed because you've dug a garden, um, the mullein might come up because the soil has been disturbed. If it's somewhere where like, you know, the grass was pulled up or maybe there was a fire somewhere or um, there was, um, you know, some kind of something like got got damaged, like the, the plants and, or the grass or whatever that was on this piece of ground got, got disturbed. Um, the mullein comes, that's when it comes, and it really helps to heal the damaged soil. It helps to bring more moisture and hold it there in dry soil and helps to connect the plants that are alive and, and, and thriving to each other uh, through this area of dry, damaged, disturbed soil. And so you can think of it doing that in the body too, wherever things are disturbed irritated, infected, damaged, broken, you know, um, the mullein comes in and it helps to nourish, bring more nourishment, bring more moisture, and reconnect the parts of the body that might have been disconnected from whatever, you know, kind of disturbance happened. And it's very safe for anybody to use, and it's amazingly effective. It's a really, really, really great herb to know about. I think it's a pretty important herb to know about. Um, it also has some antiviral properties, actually. So um, you can take it when you have a cold and such, uh, the tea from mullein, and it can be really effective. Um, so then, what else? <laughs> um, let's see what else I want to share with you. Uh, so this one here, I've got another good one. Uh, this is a plant that a lot of people see growing in the wild, these great big leaves, and they think that it's rhubarb, and they tell me, oh yeah, I've seen wild rhubarb around. And um, so it's, I've never seen rhubarb growing in the wild. It, it occasionally seeds itself in somebody's garden, but it can't seed itself so well that you'll find it growing on the sides of trails and such. So this is burdock. This is, um, this is a different plant. Uh, this is the plant that makes the burrs that stick to us when we go for walks in the fall or they stick to our pets. And, um, and then, you know, we have to keep pulling them off. And it's an ingenious uh, method that the plant has created to seed itself. Um, so the, uh, these, these great big leaves, uh, if you feel them, you'll notice that they have texture. They've got uh, little tiny hairs on them, so they feel a little bit velvety, and uh, whereas the leaves of um, rhubarb are smooth. And the stalks, too, they're kind of a little purpley, like, um, like, like rhubarb stalks, but they have a lot of texture. They're, they're kind of fuzzy. So again, like the rhubarb stalks are smooth, right? So those are some ways you know that it's definitely not rhubarb. And um, if you were to dig in the ground underneath these leaves, you would find a very deep 
taproot. It grows several feet down into the ground and it's just this long, 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 long taproot, like a super long carrot, except it's brown colored. And that is a delicious food. Burdock root is, it's known as gobo in Japanese cuisine, and it is very common there. It's cultivated. Um, and here we have it growing wild, and we can eat the wild variety, and it's just as delicious. Um, in fact, today I was teaching a class in herbal medicine, and um, we got to try some, uh, some burdock root, a little bit of burdock root. Uh, for lunch, which was a treat because this is the time of year in the fall where you can start to harvest it. Um, the fall is a really good season for harvesting the roots of plants um, because the, um, the, root, the plant has had a chance to really grow and develop throughout the whole season and the root has become very full. And at this time of year, the plants have finished um, flowering, they've finished producing fruits or seeds, um, or they are losing their leaves and they're going dormant and all the nutrients and all the energy are going back down into the roots and the roots are gathering all the goodness. So if you, if you dig the roots, that's where you're, that, you know, this time of year is when you're going to get um, the highest quality roots. So it's, um, it's burdock root digging season and you need to have some serious elbow grease and dig really, really deep if you um, want to harvest burdock root, but it's worth it. This root is very tasty. It's slightly sweet and it also has this really interesting nutty flavor. Um, in Japanese cuisine, there's this dish uh, that's common uh, where it, they commonly use it, it's called kinpira, and um, it involves um, cutting the root up, root up into little kind of matchstick sized pieces, and then you would take carrot roots and you'd cut them up in the same kind of shape, and then you would cook them with um, uh, maybe some onions and some tamari sauce in a uh, preferably in a good a deep cast iron pan and you'll cook them for a long time on low heat and they just simmer in each other's juices and it makes this really delicious dish that's very uh, very good for this time of year and for the winter because uh, burdock root has a lot of immune boosting properties. Um, one of them is that it has uh, it has a constituent um, uh, uh, carbohydrate uh, known as inulin and inulin is um, you, you'll find it in the burdock root if you dig them in the fall or the late summer when you chop them up this kind of white juice comes out of the root and that's the inulin and so it's a starch and it is a prebiotic so it will feed all the good microbes in your gut which will then allow them to reproduce and you'll have more healthy microbes that can help to fight off any offending microbes and that's a really important way of boosting your immune system so that's one way that burdock does this um, it's a warming herb and um, it also helps to build the blood and produce more white blood cells over time um, so burdock root uh, cooked into kampira is wonderful. We also just chop it up into like little rounds and add it to soups and that's a really nice way to eat it as well. Um, and burdock root is also a really tremendous source of iron. Uh, this root grows so deep that of course it pulls up lots of nutrients from the soil and, and iron is a really big one that it pulls up. So I chop it up and I put it in a jar and I pour apple cider vinegar over it. And the apple cider vinegar actually draws out the minerals and so the iron becomes like really accessible. And then I just use that apple cider vinegar on my salad dressings and um, I'm getting all this iron plus a lot of the health benefits of the burdock. Um, which is, it also is, it helps to cleanse your liver and it's kind of detoxifying. It's pretty detoxifying. Um, so it's, it's really beneficial in kind of toning your system and getting you ready to take in more nutrients and let go of what you don't need. Um, it also helps to clear your lymph system really nicely and um, prevent irregular cell growth. So um, we use it to help prevent cancer. And in herbal medicine, we also use burdock root actually to treat cancer um, uh, among a whole bunch of other herbs, but it's one of the herbs that can be really helpful. Now, um, burdock, uh, if you wanted to dig the root, 
you would want to get it from a plant that looks like this one where the leaves are about this size and you see that this plant is not making burrs. There's no stalk coming up from it making any flowers or seeds. The ones that have the burrs are in their second year of growth. This is also a biennial plant. So in its second year of growth, it's going to develop this um, flowering stalk. It'll make these little purple balls of flowers that will turn to those burrs when, when they go to seed. And then it'll die back and it gets really, really tall if it's not mowed or anything. And so um, if you dug the root of that plant, you would get um, a very woody root that didn't have that many nutrients in it because basically all the energy went up to the flowers and creating the seeds and then it died. Um, so uh, the, the, the root, what you want to get the root from the first year plants that are not sending up a flowering stalk. And for that, um, you, you aren't, you're just going to see those leaves on the ground, just like I showed you. Um, so that's, this is what you're looking for, um, or maybe leaves that are slightly smaller. And then um, you need to just keep digging and digging and digging deep in order to get this root. And there's a good chance you might break the root when you dig it because it grows so deep, it's hard to get it all. But it, that's okay, you can still eat what you get and that's still um, really beneficial. So, um, so uh, Noah says, well, it's great to harvest burdock whenever you can. It can be invasive and known to kill small songbirds that get stuck in the seed heads. I have not seen that. I didn't know that. But um, the seed heads are very sticky and they do have a good source of food um, for birds. And um, like the thistles, which are their cousins, burdock is not native to this area. That is true. It's not really considered to be one of the major invasive plants, but there are places where it can grow in abundance. And of course, it has this brilliant way of spreading itself by sticking seeds to you and then you pull it off some, pull them off somewhere else, those burrs, and the, and the seeds get dispersed. And it's really resilient. I mean, it's such a resilient plant. So this is the kind of resilient energy you can get from wild plants, a plant like burdock where people don't like it and they want to get rid of it and it still thrives and, uh, and, it, and it, it takes up lots of space and it's, uh, it's able to draw so many nutrients to itself. It's wonderful. Um, but you do want to be aware about having, um, about where you're getting the burdock from if you're going to harvest it. So I want to point this out as well because um, even though it is not native to this land, um, you know, I mean, neither are many of us, right? And, uh, and us being here and, um, and, and our lifestyle and such, we know that there's a lot of pollutants around right now and the earth is having to deal with a lot of toxicity. Um, and where burdock really thrives actually is on um, pretty toxic soil in like junkyards and in, um, you know, like old like car lots and in um, places where there's, you know, uh, lots of chemicals maybe in the soil burdock will do really well. And this is part of its resilience. It thrives where other plants might not be able to survive in that type of toxic environment. But with those deep roots, it will draw up heavy metals and it will transmute them back into plant matter, break down back into organic matter, and it'll help to heal the soil. And so on land that's regenerating, where there was a lot of toxicity, and now it's... Um, you know, no, there's no longer, it's no longer being, you're not, we're not putting any more pollutants on it, but it needs to regenerate. Burdock will come in and really thrive. It's actually a really important bio remediating plant. And um, you'll find that if you watch that piece of land that's regenerating, uh, the burdock will decrease in numbers over the years as it cleans that land. Um, but if you're going to harvest the root, you want to make sure that you're getting it from land that is clean and um, be aware of that because it will thrive on land that's not necessarily clean. And then it's being medicine for the earth and it's not going to be such good medicine for us. So something to keep in mind. Um, so 
Uh, also, you know, look for those, look for those, um, those stalks with the burrs on them. And if you see them, then look around for those leaves because you know that they seeded themselves nearby. Um, so, and then uh, somebody, Sheena is just saying this, the roots also send runners. So if you find second year plants, there may be other first year plants nearby. So I have never seen that. I've never seen runners from uh, burdock roots. They're pretty deep taproot in my experience, unless the roots gotten broken um, and then maybe it might start shooting up somewhere else, but they do drop their seeds all around. And so the first year plants will come up where the seeds drop and they're, they're very, um, you know, they're resilient seeds. They seed themselves very easily. So um, yes, Olivia, there's a creek near my house that's quite polluted with, with burdock nearby. Should I avoid harvesting those? Possibly, you know, if the creek's pretty polluted and the burdock's right there, um, the soil is probably kind of polluted around it. You want to be aware of that. Um, you know, it's, it's like, uh, if you know that the soil is not, that it's not toxic, there's no more toxicity being put into it, you could wait a few years for the, for the land to regenerate a bit, and then you could harvest burdock from it, maybe. Um, and maybe there's some well, way that you're, you'd be able to test like heavy metal levels and such in the soil, get the soil tested. But yeah, if you're uncertain and it's near a polluted creek, I would say you want to kind of err on the side of caution there. You don't want to be taking in any of those heavy metals. Uh, you know, burdock root, like the thing about um, heavy metals, and minerals is that they're so kind of close chemically, so we're closely related that um, both the plants and our cells will take them up similarly. So the burdock will take up heavy metals if that's what's around. If the soil is clean, it'll take up minerals. And then we take it in and we'll get those minerals. But if there's the heavy metals, we'll take it in and we could get the heavy metals in us. And our, they can bind to receptor sites on our cells. Our cells might think that they're, um, that they're a mineral that we need when actually they're um, not what we want and they take the place of those minerals that we need so you you don't you want to avoid heavy metals and you want to avoid burdock that's growing in soil that might have heavy metals in it um, i have taken burdock seeds and planted them in my garden so that i would have access to burdock in a place that i knew it was clean where the soil was loose and i could dig it myself and um, so that's a good idea however it will take some of the minerals away from some of the other plants in your garden so you need to make sure you're feeding your other plants nicely and also I found that even when I put it in the loose garden soil um, my soil on my land goes really deep and I could not extract the whole root of the burdock it just grows so deep so um yeah, so so burdock is, um, it's a really interesting, it's a really fascinating plant. And I think, you know, one more thing I would say about it is that, um, you know, the way that I was talking about making that vinegar with it, um, that is, so that's a really nutritious way to take it. And it gives this, this nutty flavor to the vinegar that's really, really tasty. People often really enjoy um uh, salad dressing that I make with burdock root infused in the vinegar when I add that vinegar and they don't know they 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 think it's really tasty and they can't pinpoint the flavor and they're like what's in this and it's it's the burdock is the magic ingredient um, and then you're getting this really nice dose of iron and other trace minerals um, something like that could be a really helpful thing to take if you have lots of skin stuff um, that you're struggling with like um, psoriasis or eczema or you tend towards rashes or maybe acne the burdock can help to clear your skin and part of how it does that is because um, it's pretty detoxifying in your system. It can help to cleanse your liver a little bit, help your liver out a little. And then when it does that, your skin will often clear because if your liver is a little bit overburdened with uh, too much that it's trying to clear at once, um, your skin becomes an organ of detoxification and stuff that your body wants to get rid of will come up through your skin. And then you get these things like rashes, acne, eczema, psoriasis. So, um, so clearing your liver at that point, supporting your liver at that point is going to be really helpful. And burdock is a herb that, that herbalists will use a lot um, in that way because we found it's been really helpful in um, clearing the skin. 
So um, that's, there's a few plants and a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm just, uh, I see that um, further up, um, Jesse was asking, how do you become a registered herbalist? So, um, so I'll just speak to that for a moment. Um, and then if you have any more questions about anything I've asked or anything else, then feel free, free to put them in the chat and I'll try to address them as well. So um, the way that you can become a registered herbalist in Ontario is that you become registered with the Ontario Herbalists Association. And um, so we are, uh, basically we need to go through a course of study that is about three years and it involves um, lots of study of the plants, but also lots of study about um, about the body, anatomy and physiology, um, and pathophysiology, the study of um, disease, uh, looking at um, the different different categories of plant, plants, different properties of plants, ways to make medicines. Um, you get lots of you, you practice in um, clinical settings. So people come to see you in a student clinic and, and you um, do this whole big health intake. We work really holistically. So I want to know, you know, we want to ask lots and lots of questions about like, what's your lifestyle like? What do you eat? What are the big health concerns that you're coming in about? But what is your history of health and your family history? history and what do you do every day and um, different all sorts of different bits of information um, that can help us to understand on a holistic level who you are and then on a holistic level you know um, how we can um, support you. We study a lot of nutrition in um, herbal medicine and so that's part of training to become a registered herbalist. And um, of course we study about um, pharmaceutical medicines, how they work in the body and how they can interact with herbs so that we can be sure that we can um, give people herbs even if they're taking other medicines and there are, that it will be safe. Um, so that is, um, that's how we, uh, become <laughs> registered herbalists. And then they, you know, they, uh, yeah, you get tested and you, and you, uh, you become recognized as a professional herbalist, and you can and you can open a clinic. and um, And so I do that. I run a clinic at my farm, um, and then I also teach classes here. I teach a lot. I really like to share information about the plants with people because I'm um, work so much right up close with the plants. Some herbalists will um, will work more. Uh, they'll they'll they won't don't have the same like regular access to the plants themselves to harvest them so they'll purchase them from someone else and they'll um they know how to work with them really well but they're not um working with the actual plants they're working more with the medicines made from the plants um but i am uh, you know i feel really fortunate that i live in a place where there are lots of wild plants i chose to do this and i'm letting the land rewild on the farm where i live so there's lots of wild stuff coming up and a lot of it is food and medicine um that i love to work with and then i you know share lots of information about that with other people like i'm doing right now um and i find that these days there is really a growing interest in learning about the plants that are growing around us how they actually can be medicine for us how they can be good sources of food and also their interactions with the land and how they're food for other creatures and how they're helping to restore ecosystems and um, how they engage with you know everyone else in the um, ecosystem so um, so that's uh, that sort of more or less what I do. Um, and I, yeah, it says on here, Tamara Hawthorne, my name is actually Tamara Siegel, but my, um, my business is called Hawthorne Herbals. So I'm at hawthorneherbals.com, which uh, I'll put here in the chat if you wanted to check out more about me. And I'm on, that's me on social media too, Hawthorne Herbals. Um, but uh, just to answer, um, Ashley asked, so um, I once became sick after eating a lot of rhubarb. Would this be because of the oxalic acids in it? So um, rhubarb does has, have some oxalic acids, but not that much in the stock. It's possible, but I would say it might also be, rhubarb is actually a really great digestive herb, um, but it's, uh, depending on how you eat it, it can be more laxative or it can be kind of constricting and cause constipation. So if it was like digestive stuff, 
you had. It might be just because you actually ate too much of it and your body was trying to determine what do I do with all of this. So I can't say for certain with that information. Um, but I, I feel like that might be more likely what was happening compared to the oxalic acid, unless what you were feeling was kind of like dry, kind of burny mouth and just like tightness, dryness. It's possible that it was the oxalic acids or if you know that you're sensitive to oxalic acids. Um, that's, I don't know, based on this opportunity, that's more or less all I can say to that. Um, and then, um, yeah, in terms of recommendations for resources to learn more about herbs and um, herbal medicine. So the Ontario Herbalists Association, um, it is ontarioherbalists.ca, I believe that's our website. And um, but uh, also, uh, I mean, there's some information there, but also um, so much great information out there right now in terms of um, if you want to learn more about herbs. So me personally, I put up information all the time. I have like, I, you know, I write blogs and I, and I uh, have stuff on my um, my Facebook and Instagram um, about herbs and I have a YouTube channel now Hawthorne Herbal so feel free to follow me I'm just getting just since the pandemic broke out I got into making videos and putting them out there and <laughs> so I'm moving into this realm, online realm as we all are um, and uh, and then um, I would recommend um, Jim McDonald um, herbcraft.org oh I think I was putting my stuff uh, the stuff that I put out there, it was not to everybody. So just a second. Um, Herbcraft.org, Jim McDonald. Um, he is a, a herbalist in Michigan that um, has so much information. He has uh, written so much about, uh, about herbs and, <laughs> oh, okay. You forwarded it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he, uh, so he has lots of blogs and he has links to lots of other um, uh, such um, like other writers and, um, and herbalists. Um, I love, um, so that's herbcraft.org. Org. Um, in your area, you might want to check out the Living Earth School of Herbalism. Um, so uh, that's Michael Vertoli, and he's a really experienced herbalist uh, just in Maple, Ontario, so just outside of Toronto, just north of Toronto. And he um, gives uh, full field day walks, plant identification walks that go for a whole day. He does them throughout the spring to fall season, and he's a wealth of knowledge if you're interested in plants as medicine. Um, any other resources? Great books. Um, yeah, uh, check out um, Robin Rose Bennett in New York, upstate New York. Um, she is has a couple books that are really good. And um, you can also check out, um, uh, who else do I want to recommend? On Wild Foods, any books by uh, Samuel Thayer. Samuel Thayer has um, three books out. Uh, that are all on wild foods and he's based in Wisconsin um, and he a lot of the plants that are there are similar and he's writing all about North America wild foods he is such a wealth of knowledge and he explains everything so well and clearly and he has the best photos and um, very very clearly differentiates between plants that look alike so you can clearly identify them talks about how and when to harvest them how to prepare them very 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 comprehensive really well written really such such a gift those books um so all three books by samuel thayer if you're interested in wild foods that's he's my top recommendation for um wild foods authors um if you are interested in you know if you have specific questions i'm always happy to hear from you feel free to reach out to me like you can reach me through my website you can email me um or whatever through social media you know send me a picture if you want to know what a particular plant is or just if you have any other questions i'm you know i love hearing from people and i really love um encouraging people to learn more about um, the wild plants i mean that's 
I feel like that's such an important thing to do. And then we appreciate the plants more. And even if they're weeds, we appreciate them more. And even if they're considered invasive, we still appreciate them more. And just changing the way that we look at plants, um, you know, as a society so that we recognize that they're here for so many different reasons. And, uh, you know, what are those reasons and how might they also be helpful to us? And I've just seen plants be so helpful for people really in so many different ways. So I, I want to encourage that as much as I can. So I'm always happy to hear from you. Ah, uh, whoo, I feel like I was just talking on and on and on. Um, so if nobody has any more questions, then um, maybe I will take, uh, the opportunity to, um, to just quickly show you a picture of one last plant because you should know about this one. Um, so, and a lot of you maybe do, uh, where do we go? Here we go, plantain. Um, so this leaf, you know, you see this growing out of the sidewalks, you see it growing out of lawns. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful food and medicine. You can use this as an edible green. You can recognize it by that oval shaped leaf with the point at the end and the veins that go from the base all the way up to the tip. They're not going out to the sides like other leaf veins. They're going all the way up to the tip. If you turn the leaf over, you'll see that the veins are sticking out on the other side. They're protruding. Um, plantain, if you get a, a sting of any kind or a bite of any kind, take this leaf and chew it up and put it right on it and it will draw out the sting. It'll draw out any venom. If you have a splinter or um, a cut that's infected, do the same thing. It is the best drawing agent and it's antimicrobial. It'll help to fight off any infection and it'll help the skin to heal. I also infuse this leaf in oil and make um, a topical salve out of it that you can put on cuts and scrapes. Um, it's also really nice and cooling and it reduces inflammation and, um, and it helps with allergies. If you have seasonal allergies, let me show you the leaf one more time. If you have seasonal allergies, hay fever, stuffy nose, watery eyes, pick one of these leaves, notice the veins going like this. Remember, turn it over and see that the veins are protruding, sticking out, and you can feel them on the underside. Plantain leaf, chew and eat a leaf and see what happens. Often this will just reduce all the inflammation, runny, drippy nose and eyes, stop the sneezing, and it works incredibly well. I often get people when I take them on plant walks and um, if, if we're outside and they, I do a lot of plant identification walks, and if somebody's sneezing from hay fever, we'll look for plantain, I'll get them to eat a leaf, and I've seen it so many times, it just uh, clears it up. And then like a little while later, maybe an hour or two later, the sniffles come back and they find another leaf and they eat it and it clears it up. Plantain is so wonderful for that. And it's totally safe for anybody anytime. So um, it's easy to recognize, safe to use, kind of classic first aid plant. I did make a video about that one where I talk more about it um, there on the, the Hawthorne Herbals uh, YouTube channel. So feel free to, to check that out if you like. Um, and I think that's more or less taking us to the end, um, unless anybody has any other, other questions or anything. Um, otherwise, maybe I'll just uh, hand it back to um, to Gabrielle or somebody who wants to to close. But I will just say thank you so much, everybody, for participating. And um, you know, step outside in this beautiful fall weather and check out the plants that are growing around you and be curious about them. Very often, the plant that's going to be really helpful for you as medicine is growing right outside your door. I kid you not. So uh, pay attention to that stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara. That was a really interesting talk. And um, it's really cool to know that all these plants, which I know I've seen everywhere, um, mm -hmm. have many uses. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for speaking tonight. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I know sometimes with online school, you know, it's, it's a lot to be online. So thank you for, you know, taking the time and coming. Mm -hmm. I think um, right. if there are no more questions, um, that's a wrap. Mm. Just some thank yous. Thank you, everybody, for your thank yous. <laughs>
it's great to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and, and enjoy the nature study. You know, if it has to be online, still it's worthwhile. So that's great. It's great that we're all participating in this.